before we leave. Is your Dutch? A can, a can of beets in the last place. Beets in the last place. Now, at the time, Puff was actually executive producing that soundtrack. And so at that time, he basically could get anybody he wanted to be on that soundtrack. Being in New York City, uh, you start out as a nobody with no money. That's what I'm doing. I'm out, I'm listening to records. I'm, I like to hear my records in the club. Um, and that's actually how I ran into Cassie. Cassie was actually, it was like, it must have been her birthday party or something like that. And her and her girls are dancing on a table somewhere. And I'm like, yo, this is, this is the life. So you go on my Twitter, look up Brian Leslie Bitcoin in 2013, it says pay me in Bitcoin. All of the folks that I'd ever worked with, they always had people, right? Oh, talk to my person, talk to my agent, my manager, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I did the meeting with Madonna, um, we did a meeting at her home in her library and as I left the meeting she said oh yeah take my number I was so what I do remember sending a screenshot of that to my mom too like you know is this even real <laughs> like your son who was you know homeless behind a barbershop is now like texting with Madonna and taking pictures with Britney Spears hey what up it's game man Nando hey what's up yo this is 50 Cent hey yeah, what up, it's your boy Fernando, aka Mr. Keep It Hot, Keep It Banging. Welcome to this, this podcast, man. Real talk, the realest conversations. This guy, wow, he's a legend in the game. He does everything. Produces, businessman, he's a Grammy nominated producer. He does it all, but he's he's a thinker. He's always busy with pushing the culture forward financially, mentally, spiritually. Hey, we go way back. The one and only Brian <laughs> Leslie. Right. Welcome. Right. You just showed me that photograph, man. 2015. Yeah, 2015, bro. Nine years flew, right? Yeah. And and we know each other from like when he was also performing at the Drum Rhythm Festival. It was like yeah. years before that. Yes, sir. Wow. Well, yes, it's, sir. it's good to see you doing your thing. How you been? I've been great. Yeah. I've, I've been amazing. You know, I think really uh, what I've always told anyone who's in my circle, man, just pursue happiness, man. So I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you find happiness, huh? Oh, I've always... You know, I've always found it, man. And I think for me, it's, it's about creating the freedom to pursue your creativity yeah. and to pursue your curiosity, whatever you're, whatever you're curious about, the ability to actually navigate life and arrange and, you know, sort of design your life that you can always be curious and pursue, pursue that curiosity. Because yeah. Yeah. This, this talk show is about... Um, inspiring people, motivating mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And I believe that hearing stories are the best way to motivate people because stories are the most powerful words that can find information. Yes. I believe that great stories give that up upliftment feeling and take you to other places. So in this conversation, I want to talk to you about you going to Harvard, you being educated, you implementing your knowledge in the real world. Also want to talk about how you uh, transformed yourself and are now focused on helping people get well educated in the financial market. Mm -hmm. I think it's also very important to also talk about it. You have a new album that came out in February. Mm -hmm. You know my speed. Go check it out. It's out right now. Um, you're on the tour as well. So we're going to be talking about that as well. Sure. And a whole bunch of stuff. Your best collaborations, top five. Okay. <laughs> Because uh, you've done a lot of you've done mm -hmm. a lot of music. You mm -hmm. work with Britney Spears, Chris Brown, uh, Beyonce. Uh, the list goes. The on. list goes on and right. on and on. So later, I'm gonna name a couple of names, and mm -hmm. then and, uh, it would be cool for you to like say what comes to mind. But first, because everybody knows you as a successful businessman, mm -hmm. um, a very smart artist. They call you also the Black Mozart, <laughs> doing your thing. Um, but there was also a period in life. When you were 19 and you already graduated from Harvard, where you were homeless. Mm -hmm. Take us to that point, to that low point. Yeah, well, you know, I wouldn't say that I was a low point. You know, I think in everyone's life, in everyone's story, there are peaks and valleys. And the ability to appreciate the peaks and valleys is what allows you to really appreciate life. And so for me, I was at Harvard. 
I was on academic probation three different times. And that really was because I was investing a great deal of time into teaching myself. I didn't have a course at Harvard for music production, but I was teaching myself. And there was one faculty member there uh, by the name of Sandy Green, now Dr. Sandy Green, who advocated on my behalf in front of the administrative board at Harvard to say, hey, look, you know, this kid should be able to stay here. Don't kick him out. And so after I finished school, I had a business plan, you know, just simple business plan. And I said, hey, you know what? If I could sell beats, if I could sell five beats a week at $1,000 per beat, then, uh, you know, or actually if I could sell five beats a week at $200 per yeah. beat, that's $1,000 a week, that's $52,000 a year. And so that was my very simple, basic, rudimentary business plan. And usually in entrepreneurship, it takes you two or three attempts before you actually are successful. And so being that this was my first attempt, that business plan was so far from what was real. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was a young brother uh, that I was working with and his older brother actually had a barbershop and uh, I was actually staying illegally on Harvard's campus. Not illegal, like camping out, but really, you know, I had already graduated and I was still using the studio and just kind of hanging out there. And at some point, um, you know, I needed to get off that campus. <laughs> and so there was a, basically a garage behind that barbershop in Randolph, Massachusetts. And that's where I posted up. Um, and, uh, man, yeah, I don't look at it as a low point, man. I look at it as a, as, you know, I think in any trajectory of someone's life, you embrace the moments where your development is going to be accelerated. True, and but- but that's how you look at it. Like, sorry for, for like, yeah. but like, that's how you look at it now. But at that moment, your parents invested in, in your, in, in your, in your study and like to get you there. Yeah. And then you're there like, okay, isn't he now supposed to be making a lot of money or something? I could imagine your parents thinking that. Was that also the way how they thought at that moment? Like, what the hell happened here? Didn't we invest <laughs> in you go yeah. to Harvard? Yeah. I think they already knew though. Uh, they, they already had an idea just because, all of my bills, yeah. since I didn't have an address, yeah. they went to my parents' house. So they already knew, hey, this bill is overdue. It's now 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Yeah. So when I finally called them and said, hey, look, you know, I got to come home. They said, we already knew. We got all the bills here. <laughs> They're waiting know. for you. Yeah, they were waiting for that call, you know? <laughs> wow. Um, and so when I did finally get home, my father actually asked me, he said, Ryan, you know, if you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? And I said, well, you know, I think really I would like to have my own equipment. You know, I was borrowing people's equipment uh, to make records, et cetera. I like to have my own. He said, okay, well, how much is that going to cost? I said, well, um, you know, I never even looked at it because I never had any money. Yeah. I never looked at how much it cost. So we looked it up and uh, really it was, you know, like 15 $16,000, something crazy. And yeah. um, he said, well, Ryan, I don't have that, but I, I did get this invitation for a credit card in the mail. And it just so happens that the limit is exactly correlated to what you need. And so I'll make you a deal. You get all the equipment. You also study for the law school admissions test, the LSAT. And not this year, but next year, okay? You you have a year to try to figure out what you're going to do with this music. And you also have to apply to law school because, and I actually have a good friend, Taj Clayton. I actually just caught up with him. Um, I actually catch up with him often, but yeah. Taj Clayton, um, you know, went to Harvard Law School. And, uh, you know, here's a guy that's doing several million dollars a year, working on multi-million dollar cases, et cetera. And so... And my father had also gone to law school, so he understood what the earning potential was there. So he said, look, I'll do the deal with you, swipe the credit card, get the equipment, work for a year, see what happens. You make me a deal, though, that in five years, you pay me back double. Right? I said, okay, cool. I love that deal. And so really, 
once again, even from a place of not having much, my father still found a way to make that investment. Uh, and he said, you know, hey, look, if I'm not going to do it, then who else will? You know, wow. and, I, and and that was an amazing vote of confidence. And uh, I think that was um, 2002, man, the fall of 2002. And in the February 2003, I got a call from my attorney. He said, Ryan, I got an internship for you. It's unpaid. It's 30 days. We're going to see what you can do yeah. in New York City. And I remember giving my mom a hug when I got on the plane. She said, Ryan, I just feel like you're not going to come back. I said, Mom, it's only 30 days. It's unpaid. I'll be right back. Yeah. And I went to New York and never came back. Wow. And where, where did you intern? So I interned actually for one of the hitmen. So okay. uh, his name was Young Lord. Uh, yeah. And he was uh, one of the hitmen, part of, uh, you know, that legendary production crew. Yeah. Um, And so that was sort of a direct line into a lot of wow, pretty amazing projects that were going on at the time. Shout out Young Lord. I stayed at his, he had a brownstone up in the Bronx and I just <laughs> stayed there. And, and did, know, just, did he have you like doing all these crazy intern stuff? Yo, give me, give me, give me the drum machine. Give me the... Nah, nah, it, it was strictly music, man. He was, he was mostly a, a, a producer that had done really well, but was sampling. And so when you sample, what happens is the original rights holders are the ones that get paid. So he was looking for somebody who could make up their own chord progressions. Right? Uh -huh. So that's, that's, that was my job. Man. I, didn't, started. I, I didn't do, I wasn't fetching coffee. I wasn't, yeah. you know, wow. I, I basically was, you know, just creating different chord progressions. Um, and, uh, that was a great time. Yeah. That was and, a great and, time. and how do you graduate from being an intern to, a producer, like now you're a full-fledged producer, successful and stuff, but that first production, how how did you get that first, like, oh, my first check? Like, like how did that come about? Yeah, so to take it back, during that year, when I was back home in Arizona, uh, basically, you know, on the couch, uh, I had a room set up with all my equipment and I made... Back then, you could burn the songs onto a CD. So I made a CD, had eight, kind of eight demos, if yeah. you will. I said, look, you know, this is going to be my best work ever. This is going to be the work that when someone listens to this, they're going to understand that this is going to be that, that gateway for me to really make a difference in music. Yeah. I knew it. It was on that little CD. Now, the reason I knew I needed to do that, though, is um, kind of even earlier on in my career, just kind of navigating. I went to Chicago, went to L.A., you know, was in Boston, in yeah. New York every once in a while. There was a brother, um, my name is Sean Collins, who actually uh, linked me. And, and really, in every artist story, there's all of these people, right? There are these very sort of pivotal people in your life. So there's a brother by the name of Sean Collins. He actually um, was introduced to me by another brother uh, who was from Rhode Island named Magic Love. Magic Love was a, uh, uh, was a break dancer or part of like the break dance community, yeah. but was moving around in entertainment circles. He says, Ryan, I know this guy out in LA. His name is Richard Walters. So we, we go into kind of a long story, but we'll get back to it. Yeah. So Richard Walters, man, says to me, he says, listen, um, we go out to LA. He says, listen, I, I like the music I'm hearing and you remind me of this kid who came out to LA that I helped before. His name uh, is Rodney Jerkins. Now, Rodney Jerkins, if you look up his, his, uh, his discography, we're talking about mega, mega, mega hit records. The Boy Is Mine. Yeah. yeah. Um, Say My Name, Destiny's yeah. Child. I mean, and the list goes on and on yeah. and on. Now, Richard told me a story about Rodney Jerkins, which stuck with me. And he said, look, Ryan, When Rodney Jerkins goes into a meeting at labels, all right, he always comes equipped with music already ready to go. And it's not just beats on a CD, it's full songs. And what he'll do is he'll go into the actual meeting and he'll sit right across from the A&R and he'll say, look, you know, what project are you working on? They say, ah, we're working on Destiny's Child. He'll say, okay, cool. Play me your top three records. So they'll play the, the you know, the, the best record that they have, the Biggest energy, et cetera. He said, yeah. okay, that's cool. Play me your number two. I said, oh, that's all right, that's cool. And then he would put his CD on and be like, look, 
this beats your number one, number two, and number three, and wow. he'll go in there and get the single, right? Um, and so that stuck with me. I said, wow, that's 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 uh that's a that's a very unforgettable way to take a meeting with someone. And I said, look, if I ever get a chance to take a meeting that's going to be that impactful, I also want to make sure that on my little CD that's burned, I can say, look, you know, play your number one, number two, whatever project you're working yeah. on, play your number one, two, three, and I have a record. My one, two, three is better than your one, two, and three, right? Yeah. So uh, my three is better than your number one, right? Um, and that stuck with me. So when I went home, got my equipment, started working on music, it was important for me that whatever I burned on that CD, I only had like eight records on there. Whatever I burned on that CD, I wanted to be able to say, okay, my number three on this is better than somebody else's number one. Just get me in the right meeting. Now, you asked about sort of my first placement, if you yeah. will, right? So there's, once again, there are levels to it. I, I had been working with a young brother who had, who was at the Berkeley College of Music. Now, right in Boston, Berkeley College of Music, some incredible talent goes there yeah. for, for college. There's a young brother by the name of, of Corey Williams. Uh, his artist's name was Latif. And we worked on, on some records together in Boston. And really my first music industry check was actually when he got signed. He actually said, look, as a part of me getting signed, my producer got to come with me. And that was really big of him to do that. And so, you know, I got four or five records on that album and, and it was pretty good money. I mean, for me at that time, you know, 7,500 to $10,000 oh, wow. per song. So that's, you know, 40, $50,000, you know what I mean? Um, and, um, and that was really the first money that happened. Now, the story with Latif though is really the story of many artists, which is that you get your deal and then you're kind of waiting around. You're yeah. waiting around. When is the label going to put the record out? Uh, am I going to get shelved? You know, uh, do they feel like I have a single? When are they going to shoot the video? So waiting, 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 right? So when I got to New York and I was doing this internship, I said, I need to make quick work of whatever I'm doing. So I got in the, in, into the uh, sort of bedroom studio he had set up and he had some drums up and straight out of the gate, I just had some chord progressions and he got hype. He got super excited. And I found out later that the reason why he was so excited is because at the time, um, the connection that he had was to the Bad Boys 2 music soundtrack. Now, at the time, Puff was actually executive producing that soundtrack. And so at that time, he basically could get anybody he wanted to be on that soundtrack. So it was Nelly, it was Mary J. Blige, it was Justin Timberlake, it was everybody. And the record that I had made my first night off the plane ended up being played during a session that Beyonce was recording. Now, anyone who's ever worked with Beyonce uh, understands that her penmanship game, her writing game, vocal arrangement game, you know, people know the voice. But her art artistry is incredible. And I wasn't in the studio, but he actually was there, played that beat and came back that night and said, yo, man, I think you're out of here. I said, what you mean? He said, well, that record that you just made, that's going to be a Beyonce record on the Bad Boys 2 movie soundtrack. Wow. And man, I, 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 I'll never forget hearing Beyonce's voice and the vocal arrangements and the harmonies and everything over that beat that I literally had just made. And I knew that that was going to be an inflection point for me in my career. Now, we still haven't played any of those records that were on that CD. No, that, okay. that was just me playing a couple of keys, et yeah. cetera, over a, a, a drum track. And so that eventually led to a meeting with Puff. And um, he at the time was working on New Edition. And so I, I said, okay, I'm going to do my Rodney Jerkins. I said, oh, yeah, play me your hottest, you know, new edition. Yeah, so, you yeah, know yeah, what I mean? yeah. And so he played me one or two joints. I said, well, you know, uh, let's play number one on my CD. We played number one on the CD. It was just a beat at the time. And uh, usually at that time in the studio, it's like a writing camp. 
So there were other writers in the studio and they see, when they see Puff start getting exciting about music, getting excited about music, they say, oh, I got a melody for this, et cetera. So they start, you know, humming melodies. I say, oh, well, actually, I, I actually have a whole song written to this as well. Because I remember from what Richard has said, he said, look, Rodney doesn't come into those meetings with just music. He comes with the completed song. Uh-huh. So I said, look, I got a complete song for this as well. You want to hear it? He said, yeah, of course. That needle dropped on that song. And um, man, like my life was already changing, but I remember like it was yesterday that that needle dropped on that song. It just started playing. I guess he had to go somewhere. Um, so um, he said, look, Young brother, you know, take a ride with me. We're riding up. And mind you, this is like my first time in New York City. I don't all, only seen it in movies, right? So riding up the concrete jungle, the immense skyscrapers, the lights of the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the soundtrack to that ride was my record that I made in my little bedroom so. in Arizona. And that soundtrack, and he just played it over and over and over and over and over again, like, over and over and over, all the way uptown. Um, and then basically, um, he kind of looked back. I was in the SUV there with uh, Gwen Niles, who was uh, working as uh, head of a and administration for him at the time. And he said, yo, Gwen, let me talk to you. So they went into, uh, I guess it was his crib at the time. And then she came back. I said, look, um, you know, he wants to manage you as a producer. And then it was we was out of there from there. You know, Puff started saying? to manage you. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Because I thought you like I thought you met Puff later yeah, on because no, no, I no, thought early. The, yeah the story yeah. we got in Europe yeah. was that you brought Cassie to him that yeah Cassie was your project and then yeah, you met Puffy afterwards right 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 no so he was my first manager huh. actually my first manager as a producer in New York City oh wow um, and uh, yeah man uh, worked on everything. Uh, we did Loon down for me. We did Loon was here like a couple of months ago. Oh, for he real? was in the studio. Okay, yeah, he dope. was also talking yeah. about the records. Yeah, the song yeah. with Mario Wine is right. That's right, the one yeah. you produced. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Down yeah, for he me, told me. Loon. Yeah. Um, we did records on making the band. We did records on Danny D. Kane. We did records on B Five at the time. And I think really for me the reason why I wanted to to actually develop my own project is because I saw time after time after time after time the records had their had a different timeline once they got turned in. So what that meant was that, you know, I can make a record and then I'm just waiting, kind of like what happened with Latif. We just waited. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When, when do they feel like they have the single? When do they want to shoot the video? When are we releasing? When is the record going to come out? What, you know, whose timeline is coming first, et cetera, et cetera. I say, hey man, this is, this is a little, um, uh, uh, I'm impatient, right? So yeah. I'm feeling impatient. I'm saying, man, this is stifling, yeah. you know? I would like for my records to get out now. Yeah. And so right around that time, you know, we're talking about 03, 04, 05, you know, this is when the internet really starts to break open the, means of discovery. Yeah. How does an artist actually get discovered? Yeah. And so the whole story of the MySpace and Cassie's record and, you know, releasing my records to eventually come overseas, that really coincided with sort of the advent of the internet as a means of discovery and the ability to actually, you know, nowadays it's like, oh, I could just put something out now. It's on yeah. every streaming platform. Back then, you really were still sort of in a label system and it was this weird, um, not weird, but generally accepted timeline of, okay, your record is going to come out when the label is good and ready. So and so at what point did you, did you discover her online and then push it that way? How did you and Cassie like get in the studio and started making records? Because we still play the record you produced for right. you. Yeah. Right, right, right. So being in New York City, uh, You start out as a nobody with no money. And, you know, like I said, I was just, you know, in in the extra bedroom, Young Lord's extra bedroom in the Bronx. Um, we did the production deal, uh, made a couple of dollars, you know, with some of the records that we were producing. Got a little one-bedroom apartment in Harlem. 
but it was more money than I had ever seen ever. Yeah. Um, and then once we got some placements, then, you know, publishing companies started to, you know, knock on the door and say, okay, look, it looks like this guy's got a future. You know, what does it take to get in business with him from a publishing relationship? So I got to New York 2003, February, and by August, September, you know, I'm going to the bank with a $650,000 publishing check from Matola Music Publishing. So there we have on one side, one mentor on a music business, you know, Sean Combs on the other side, Tommy Matola. you put the two of those together. They're like icons, legends. I mean, you know, really undeniable their mark on music at that point. So you go from being, or for me, I'm going from a complete nobody with no money to now I can get in any club because my record is the hottest record in that club. Yeah. I got money in my pocket. I sent my dad his, yo, dad, you gave me five years for, for double your money. Here's, here's double your money now in six months. And, um, so, you know, that's what I'm doing. I'm out. I'm listening to records. I'm, I like to hear my records in the club. Um, and that's actually how I ran into Cassie. Cassie was actually, it was like, it must have been her birthday party or something like that. And her and her girls are dancing on a table somewhere. And I'm like, yo, this is, this is the life. <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? And so, um, caught up with her. Um, and yeah, yeah hey, what man. up? I'm right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 and we just kind of caught up. Um, and, uh, like I said, um, I guess her mother's birthday was coming up and she said, hey, my mom for her birthday wants to hear what I sound like on record. And she knows we're hanging out and, you know, can we put some more record for my mom? Well, she never sang before that. Well, I guess she has maybe sung in <laughs> high school, maybe done like, you know, music theater or something like that. But she, that wasn't what she was in New York, straight modeling. Like she had a okay. massive Target billboard in Times Square. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, so, um, she said, hey, my mom would like to hear, you know, what I sound like, you know, on record. Could we do something for her? I said, yeah. Um, when's her birthday? She said, oh, well, it's like two days from now. So, okay, we need to get busy, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, we, we got to work. Um, and I'll never forget the next day, uh, she wanted to pick up the CD so she could FedEx it to her mom. We couldn't email it at that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. FedEx the CD yeah. to her mom. Yeah. And she says, yo, you know, um, where, where can I pick the CD up from? And I said, well, I'm at Tommy's office on Fifth Avenue, Tommy Matola's office. You can come up here, get the CD. And, you know, we'll, after I leave this meeting, we'll, we'll go FedEx it together. So Tommy says um, to me, uh, cause she walked in the lobby and Tommy's like, yo, who's that in the lobby? Cause she, you know, very, very striking. Yeah. You know, anytime somebody saw her, it was striking. He said, yo, who's that in the lobby? I said, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's Cassie. Yeah, that's that's yeah. He says, he says, um, yeah, t you know, I love to meet her. Tommy yeah, yeah. Said, oh, so what do you do, et cetera? You know, what brings you to the office? Yeah. She said, oh, well, I need to, um, FedEx the CD to my mom. I said, CD? You sing? She's like, no, I, I don't really sing like that. But he said, nah, let me, let me hear it. He's like, Ryan, you didn't tell me. I said, well, nah, this was just something we were doing at Center of Mom, a birthday present kind of thing. We played the record. Um, it was, it, it ended up making it onto her first album. It was a record called Kiss Me. And the record is interesting because I think the first time we got in the studio, Cassie didn't really understand the recording process was like, you got to take it over and over and over again, et cetera. Yeah. And she wanted to go out. And so I said, okay, you could just leave and I'll sing the second verse. And then at least we have a finished song we can send to your mom. So the second verse had me on the song yeah. and I finished producing it and everything. And Tommy hears it and he's like, oh, this is out of here. And this wasn't even the me and you or anything. It was just, you know, this... <laughs> duet that we had yeah. done. Yeah. And I remember him finishing that meeting and literally taking her by the hand and walking her around the entire office, um, Casablanca records and saying, Hey, this is our new artist. And I'm like, wow, this is that quick. Just, just like that from walking into the lobby to wow. send a CD that we had made for her mom's birthday to now 
being introduced as the new artist of Casablanca Records. Now, he had just signed um, Lindsay Lohan. I mean, yeah. like, yeah. I mean, he got big, you know, big artists yeah, yeah, over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, And just kind of walked her around and said, yo, this is, this is, uh, this is the new artist. Um, and so... Uh, so he convinced her to sign a record deal, like, we're going to do this music thing. I believe in this. And she was like, okay. I mean... <laughs> At that point, I think if you're if you're in your late teens, yeah, and you walk into the office, and it's Tommy Mottola, right? So that means you see Jessica Simpson, multi platinum, Jennifer Lopez, multi platinum, Lauren Hill, multi platinum, Fuji's, Michael Jackson. I mean, yeah. the list goes on. Yeah. This guy was, you know, former chairman CEO of Sony yeah, Music. Yeah, yeah. You see all of that, and you just walk in, and he says, "Yo, this is what we're doing." I don't know who says no at that point, yeah. right? And obviously, it's not like she signed right there in that meeting, but she's like, I'll go along with it. <laughs> you know, yeah. the new artist. And then basically, um, he says, yo, you know, um, we." she left with the CD to go to the FedEx. He said, Ryan, we should take a meeting. We took a meeting. And he says, look, you know, um, this is your shot, kid. He says, look, either you're going to sign her or I'm going to sign her. And I said, okay, well, you know, I, I'm completely new at this. You know, I, I made a record, you know, thinking I just would have, you know, um, a record for her mom's birthday. But now this is now turning into something real. Luckily, at the time, I had, you know, good legal counsel, et cetera. And so, you know, Cassie was the first artist signed to Next Election, uh, which was the imprint at the time. Yeah. And, um, and, Man, we we, we signed it together with Tommy Motola. So there was like Yeah, so know. Tommy signed as the management. Okay. Uh she signed to Next Election. And and we got to work making records. 